Hello and welcome to lecture six, where we're going to talk about the demodulation of DSB. So sometimes we just call it DSB without the SB. So remember that stands for double sideband suppressed carrier, where suppressed means there is no carrier or no carrier component in the spectrum. That's what we mean, because all modulation requires some kind of carrier. But suppressed carrier means no carrier component in the spectrum. So just as a reminder where we are at, we are currently in at lecture six. And this is the last of the six lectures which will be included in the test on the 17th of March. Okay, so these first six lectures from one to six all talk about um, amplitude modulation. Well, at least this set talks about amplitude modulation, and the first two were simply to introduce the idea of a communication system and modulation. And just as a reminder, in terms of the module schedule, we are currently in week five. This is our lecture here. On Wednesday, there will be a problem class, a catch-up session. And next Wednesday, the 17th, that is your class test. So make sure you're available for that. And again, don't forget that you have until midnight on Sunday to complete the weekly progress check. Okay, so in contrast to last week's long lecture, this is a very short lecture, and most of it will be a recap of what we spoke about last week. So last week, we introduced the idea of DSB-SC, or double sideband suppressed carrier. And we said that's similar to AM, except there isn't a carrier component. So let me remind you, if you have a message that looks like that, that's your baseband message with a, a bandwidth of that much, then Modulating that using AM will result in two sidebands, an upper sideband and a lower sideband, in addition to the carrier component. So we call that full AM. Its proper name is DSBLC. Now, what we can do is not include this carrier component. So here you've got a missing carrier. So that, that's why we call it suppressed carrier. So that's your DSB-SC. So if you look at the spectra, they're both very similar. DSB-LC and DSB-SC both have the same bandwidth, which is twice FM. So if that was FM here, you'd have a bandwidth of 2 FM. And here, you would also have a bandwidth of 2 FM. We also introduced something called SSB, or single sideband, where instead of having two sidebands, one, two, you'd only have one sideband. That could be the upper sideband, or it could be the lower sideband. And you'll notice there isn't a carrier, so we can also say it's SSB SC, because there's no carrier. But we don't normally say that. And finally, we introduced the idea of something called the vestigial sideband, where you have one full sideband and you have one partial sideband. So this lower sideband, or it could be the upper sideband, is partial. So we call that a vestigial sideband. So we, we, we include it because it's un. Uh, feasible to filter out the lower sideband completely, so some of that sideband is uh, transmitted, but all the information that we need is in the complete sideband. And this is used predominantly for analog television, so there's less and less of this about. We also spoke about how DSB is modulated, how it's generated, and today we'll talk about how it's demodulated. So as a reminder, 
mathematically, and when I say mathematically, in contrast to experimentally. So in the lab, generating SS, uh, DSP isn't this easy, but for our purposes, we'll just look at it mathematically. It's a simple multiplication process where you have your message, your baseband message, and you have your high frequency carrier. This carrier is generally the result either of some kind of carrier. Um, so it's, it's a local oscillator. Let's just say there's a local oscillator. So you have some kind of signal generator generating this high frequency carrier and it's multiplied by the message and your result, your band pass signal in the time domain looks like that. And in the frequency domain, it looks like that. So these are essentially the same signal. So that was lecture five. We also summarized that in this little table where we look at these four types of amplitude modulation. We spoke about how they have different um, spectral requirements, different bandwidths, different power efficiencies, and different levels of complexity for the electronics at the transmitter and receiver. And we spoke about the different applications of these. So we just said um, VSB is used for analog TV, and AM is used for terrestrial broadcast. DSB, very often it's used for garage openers and car key fobs, but also used in uh, air traffic control. And SSB with the um, high noise immunity and the, um, the uh, smallest bandwidth requirement is used in point-to-point -point radio. So today we're going to talk about the demodulation. So that's the detection, that's recovery of our original message from DSB. Just like we spoke about the demodulation of AM, today we're going to talk about the demodulation of DSB. We call this kind of demodulation coherent or synchronous detection, in contrast to the non-coherent and the asynchronous detection that we used for AM. We're going to talk about the effect of frequency and phase errors at the receiver. So it's a short lecture coming up later in the week. On Wednesday, there's going to be a problem class. And Wednesday 17th, there'll be your class test. So make sure you're ready for that. There'll be no reset opportunity for the class test. It'll be a timed test and you need to be available at 10 a.m. It's an online test. So we're talking about the demodulation of DSB. This is what the modulation looks like. It's just a multiplication. Remember we said we simply multiply the message times the carrier. That's the message. That's your carrier. So if this is our message, baseband, this is your band pass. What's missing? If you compare this to AM, in AM you would have a carrier component here, but in DSB you don't have that. So now our problem is how we're going to recover this message. What can we do to bring this back to baseband? So modulation was an increase in frequency. That's modulation. We're shifting in frequency, shifting up, demodulation is a shifting down. So what can we do to shift this spectrum back to baseband? And the answer is actually really, really easy. We do exactly what we did when we modulated. So how did we modulate? We simply multiplied. That modulator was simply a multiplier. Oh, sorry, no. Here we're looking at DSB with large carrier. So there's, uh, we're adding DC and then multiplying. And recovery involved an envelope detector. So this is just a reminder 
of how we would have done this for um, AM. We spoke about the rectifier and the low-pass filter. But this isn't suitable for DSB-SC. Why is that? Well, for DSB-SC, where there's no carrier component, you have this kind of signal here, where the envelope actually crosses over. So you have phase reversals here and here. So this, although we can use an envelope detector, the envelope detector would probably pick up something like this. And if this was audio, if this was voice, it would probably still be barely under, understood. We could, still, we could still recognize the voice. But because of this distortion, there would also be higher harmonics, so high-frequency harmonics. It would be a distorted um, signal. So it would be unsuitable for um, important communications or for music. But if it was just for voice and we tried using an envelope detector, we could probably just about um, understand what's being said. So we don't generally even attempt to use an envelope detector for DSB. Remember, DSB isn't generally used for audio broadcasts. It's used for um, applications where there's limited power at the transmitter. So for portable devices like handheld um, uh, remote controls. So this is what I was talking about earlier. The modulator is simply a multiplication of your message and your carrier. Here you have upper sideband, lower sideband, but no carrier. So just remind yourself what's actually happening here. Your message, in this case, probably had a, um, a spectrum that looks like this. So this message here probably looked like that in the frequency domain. And after multiplying by a cosine, this was shifted up and down. Notice and down. So it was shifted up and you ended up with this. And down, you ended up with that. Now, where did this come from? Well, that's just the other side of the same spectrum. So that's your lower side. So by multiplying by a high frequency carrier, this spectrum was shifted up and shifted down. So now our problem for demodulation is how we're going to shift that down again. And the answer is we just do the same again. We just multiply by the cosine again. And I'll show you how that works out mathematically by talking you through this. So um, this multiplication here is this here. So that's that multiplication. That's your message. That's your carrier. Now, if we assume that our message is simply a cosine, then you have a product of two cosines. Now, remember, when you multiply two cosines, you end up with a sum term and a difference term. And this is what we mean by the shift up and the shift down. And remember, the Fourier transform modulation property or the frequency shift property, this is it. When you multiply by a cosine, you end up shifting the frequency up and down. So when we're demodulating, what we do is we take our band pass signal. So this 
is our signal that's already been multiplied. Sorry, this is our signal that's already been multiplied by a carrier. So this is your message, and that's your carrier. Together, we call this S of T. So this is your a, a DSB signal. All right. At the receiver, at the demodulator, we multiply this by a local oscillator. So this, this local carrier which has the same frequency and the same phase as your, a, a, your DSB signal, we multiply the two and that gives you this second cosine. So here we now have cosine times cosine, cosine squared. That gives you 1 plus cosine 2 omega ct. And that's where you get this. 1, 2. So neither of these are particularly useful for us. But if you notice, this 1, when multiplied by the cosine, gives us this term here. And this is really good news for us, because this is our original signal. This is m of t, or at least if we ignore the half, that's m of t. So this is what we're trying to do. We're trying to recover this, and we've done that. But wait! What about all this? This is not part of the signal we want. So we need to somehow remove these. And if you think in the frequency domain, if this is your message, then this and that are your upper and lower sidebands. So you've got FC, FC plus FM, and FC minus FM. So original message, upper sideband, lower sideband. What we have here is what we have at this point in the diagram after the multiplication. We have twice Fc plus Fm and twice Fc minus Fm. So all of this is high frequency. We want to block that and to keep this. So what kind of filter would we use to retain only our original message? We would use a low-pass filter because it would allow this to stay and it would block this. So we use a low-pass filter to block all these high-frequency components. So here we have the high-frequency components that are blocked by the filter. So our demodulator actually consists of a multiplier and a low-pass filter. In addition to a local oscillator that has the same frequency and phase as the incoming DSB signal. In practice, this oscillator will recover the frequency from the incoming DSB signal. We use a circuit called a carrier recovery circuit. So we use carrier recovery. So we use a phase locked loop to actually capture the frequency and phase of the incoming signal so that we can multiply it. And in a minute we'll look at um, the consequences or the results of having an inaccurate frequency or phase. So the demodulation of DSB consists of a multiplier and a low-pass filter in addition to a local version of the uh, message.
The original message is recovered, although it's attenuated, it's scaled down. By how much is it scaled down? Well, you could say it's scaled down by a half, but actually it's scaled down by much more because this message will have traveled maybe many hundreds of kilometers, or at least many kilometers, before it actually arrived at the receiver. So it will already have been attenuated by much more than half. So it will be attenuated by a great deal, but it will then be amplified inside the receiver. But mathematically, we have this factor of half. Okay, but we consider this to be attenuated and scaled down because of the route it has taken from the transmitter to the receiver. Okay, so this really is the summary of today's lecture. The DSB is demodulated by multiplying by a local version of the carrier and then passing through a low-pass filter. The low-pass filter needs to have a cutoff frequency. The cutoff frequency should be roughly FM. So whatever the bandwidth of the message is, your cutoff frequency should be around about that value. It can't be less because then you would be filtering your signal, you'd be removing the higher frequency components of your signal. It can't be more than FM because then you'd just be allowing noise into your system. So the cutoff frequency should be close to the bandwidth of your message. We call this kind of demodulation synchronous or coherent. Why do we call it synchronous? Because we have this local oscillator that is in sync, in phase, with your incoming DSB signal. All right, so we call it synchronous. So whatever the frequency of your carrier here should be the same as the frequency of your carrier here. So compare this to the envelope detector. The envelope detector didn't have one of these, and then we would call it asynchronous. We called it non-coherent. Now, last point for today's lecture is consider what would happen if the frequency of your local oscillator wasn't exactly the same as the frequency of your incoming DSB. What if there was an error, a frequency error of delta omega? What if there was a phase error of delta phi? So instead of having a cosine, you would have a sine where your incoming signal was a cosine. What if there's an error in phase or frequency or both? How do we deal with that? Well, it will affect the quality of the recovered message. So your recovered message, m hat there, won't be the same as it would be if these didn't exist. I don't say it won't be the same as M of T because it'll never be the same as M of T because there'll always be some kind of uh, attenuation in addition to noise because the, by the time the message arrives here it will already have been attenuated that means it's been amplified down, scaled down and there'll also have been noise added to it remember we said that the signal is vulnerable it's exposed once it's in the channel so, how does this frequency and phase error further cause M of T to depart from the original message? Well, we're going to look at the maths on the next couple of slides. So, remember our incoming message, or incoming signal, S of T. We're going to multiply it, because that's what we do at a demodulator or at a coherent demodulator. We're going to multiply it by a cosine, but this time we have these two error terms. Right, so these are the error terms. Ideally, we'd want these to be zero. Now, if you just follow the maths, S of t, we can rewrite as 
A. Now, I don't mean A to be AM multiplied by AC, because, as I said, the signal has already been attenuated and scaled down. So A is just some amplitude, whatever the amplitude is after it's come in to the detector and it's been amplified, some amplitude A. And we multiply by this cosine term. So now we have cosine multiplied by cosine. Remember that gives us cosine of the sum and cosine, mm -mm -mm. I was going to say cosine of the difference, but no, what we have is cosine of the sum, so omega c plus omega c gives you 2 omega c, and cosine of the difference, omega c minus omega c, so you end up with this the only thing that remains is this and this, because these cancel out. So you've got the sum and the difference. Now, looking at this, where is our message? This is the message. This is what we're looking for. And it's being multiplied by something that we're not particularly happy with. So this is if you like, a distortion term, this bit between brackets. So ideally, we would want this to be equal to 1. So if this was 0, delta phi, and if delta omega was 0, then you would have 0 here, 0 here, 0 here, 0 here, and after passing this through the low-pass filter, this would all be removed, and you just end up with that. Or if you think if this is your high-frequency component, then this is your resulting distortion term. This is your distortion term after the low-pass filter. So rather than referring to that as the low pass as the distortion term if you consider this to be your distortion term then if this was zero and if this was zero you'd have cosine zero equals one and multiplying by one is fine and everything's good in practice these might not be zero and therefore you would end up with either cosine delta omega t, or cosine delta phi, or both. So that will give you a distorted recovered message. Okay, and that's what we try to avoid, but we often find unavoidable. So the question is how? What does this actually do to your message? And what does this do to your message? And what do they both do together? So, notice that one of these is multiplied by t, one is a factor of t, and one isn't a factor of t. So, the one that is multiplied by t is a factor of t. You have a cosine term. So this cosine term will look like this. Assuming that delta omega is very small compared to uh, omega m, then you're going to have an, a pulsing, a, a variation in amplitude. So you'll have a high amplitude, low amplitude, high amplitude, low amplitude. And what that causes is a beating, a beating distortion. And the frequency of this beating is twice this frequency. Why do you think it's twice the frequency? That's a question for you to think about. So, what we end up hearing is our message, but with a beating. So the beating means it's becoming louder than quieter, louder than quieter, louder than quieter. And it happens quite fast. It's often um, two or three times a second. So while you're listening to your broadcast, um, it, you might hear some kind of a distortion that sounds like this. <laughs> 
And actually, it doesn't um, sound like a tapping, like I was tapping on the screen. It actually sounds like a pulsing. So the, the sound actually becomes louder than quieter, louder than quieter, louder than quieter, many times uh, or several times a second. So it's beating. It makes it very difficult to follow what you're listening to. You can sometimes just about make out uh, what's being said, but it's still um, difficult. But if, the, if there is no frequency error, if all we have is a phase error, then this isn't a function of time. There's no t in there. So this is actually a constant. So you're multiplying your incoming or your recovered message by a constant. And multiplying by a constant is okay. It just means that your signal is attenuated. It's scaled down. It's like turning down the volume. So you have a quieter signal. And that's okay unless your phase error is 90 degrees or pi over 2 radians. That's no good because cosine pi over 2 equals 0. And 0 is no good because that means it wipes out your message. So you end up with silence. That's no good. So as long as the phase error isn't pi over 2, you can still recover your message. You just need to turn up the volume or amplify your signal a little bit. And as I said, in practice, we have a carrier recovery circuit that actually um, tries to remove um, or to minimize these frequency and phase errors. Now, a question for you, and it's a question that actually appeared in an exam a couple of years ago is can we use this kind of coherent detector that we spoke about today on the kind of AM that we spoke about two weeks ago, i.e. DSB-LC? Can we apply this to DSB-LC? The answer is yes, but I'll, you, I'll, I'll leave you to try to figure out why and how. Okay, so that was, that was lecture six, where we spoke about the demodulation of DSB-LC. For SSB and VLC, we're not going to be talking about demodulation for those two. Okay, so we, we're only interested in DSB-SC modulation. Okay, so we've spoken about how synchronous or okay, coherent demodulation works mathematically. And we spoke about the effect of having a frequency error and a phase error. And we said the frequency error, that's your delta omega, and your phase error, delta phi. And we said that frequency error results in beating in the recovered message, and phase error results in attenuation. So on Wednesday, we're going to have a catch-up Q&A session. If you have any questions, you're welcome to ask. And I'll go through some problems from the problem sheet, hopefully to prepare you for the class test on Wednesday the 17th. So I hope you found that uh, helpful. Um, until we meet again, I hope you stay home and stay safe.